We're happy you checked out RCC online and are part of our church family. Our mission as a church is to help people take their next step in developing their relationship with God. Our current series, Make It Count, is all about making your life and church count for something. For more information or to give online, check out rccsunday.com. Good morning. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at RCC. I'm happy that you're here this morning. Um, wasn't the band amazing this morning? Sadly, they, well, maybe in a good way, they just sang you the whole sermon. Um, that song, I think the title is You Say. Is that correct? Does anyone know the title of the song for sure? Is you, you Say? Okay. Go home and listen to that after the sermon. Because what they sang, if you can own that in your heart, they, they essentially just sang the Bible to you. And that would be a great way for you to worship this week on your own, would be to sing that song. Because what, what they sang is, is exactly what I'm teaching about this morning. Um, sometimes people would say, oh, the band is so good, they're so talented, the singers or the instruments or whatever, they're so good. Uh, and you miss the fact sometimes that it's pure worship what they're doing. They're, they're literally singing scripture and, and worship with you back to God. It's amazing stuff. So never, never be thrown off by all the talent. It's great that they're talented. But really get, take the opportunity to worship with them as they lead you to sing to God. Because that, that was pure. What, what they sang was not only a, a, an excellent song, but it's so pure biblically. Um, it's an amazing thing. So go home, listen to you say this week, and then see if you can own those words in your own heart after listening to the sermon today. We continue. That's the second week of our Make It Count series. Uh, it may seem kind of weird, like Make It Count. Why, you know, why would you call a series that? What is, what is counting or addition, subtraction, all that stuff? What does that have to do with God and, and the Bible? And what does it have to do with faith? But we showed last week that math matters to God and that God is still counting in the world today. And then as I explained the title, Make It Count, the it in the middle, that's your life. We want to help you make your life count, and we want together to make our church count as a church family. We don't, we don't just want to host services on Sunday and kind of play church. We want to be a church, a, a group of people that believe in God, that believe in Jesus, that actually change the community because of our belief. We want to be church. We want to make our church count. To begin, last week we talked about four factors in God's addition. I said he always starts with vision, and then leadership, and then commitment, and then you. And then when you do those things, when you embrace those things, God does miracles through us. That was last week. And you could listen online if you'd like. But today I want to show you how those same four factors, how they kind of figure in to God's subtraction. Because God will make you count, he'll make me count, he'll make our church count through subtraction as well. Now with subtraction, there's kind of more of a negative like sort of feel to the word subtraction. You know, like subtracting time from our family or subtracting dollars from our wallets or subtracting hair, um, subtracting, can, yeah, I know, <laughs> subtracting can always seem kind of bad. But there's a positive side to subtraction as well. Subtracting time wasted, subtracting strokes from your golf game, subtracting minutes from your running time, even subtracting pounds. Subtracting, subtracting can be a really good thing. In the right circumstances, subtraction can be just as great or even better than addition. And I've discovered when it comes to how God works in our spiritual lives, we grow just as much through subtraction as we do addition. So last week, as I was talking about addition, I mentioned this guy named Gideon. I mentioned him from being in the Bible in the Old Testament. And we talked a tiny bit, but, but really, Gideon's life is, is more about some serious subtraction than it is addition. And we're going to look at that today because God does some amazing things in Gideon's life through subtraction. Now here's kind of the, the context of the Gideon story, if you don't know it. Gideon was an Israelite. The Israelites were at odds with the Midianites. Now I know some crazy Bible names, right? Israelites, Midianites. Um, not much different, like the Packers are playing the Vikings today, right? And it, like, you know about the Vikings, they're like a thousand years ago, and they traveled the seas and took over land. You, you all kind of know the Viking story. Well, Midianites were like a couple thousand years before them. Really tough people, desert people. If, if they had a football helmet now, if there was a team called the Midianites, it might have like goat horns on it or something, because they're like the farming kind of people. So the Midianites, it was just a group of people, no different than the, than, than the Vikings, right? But they were tough, and they were always at odds with the Israelites. They, they, they were warring for years. And at this point in history, the Midianites are kind of dominating. They have the Israelites really scared. The Israelites are living in caves and hollows and dens and stuff, trying to, trying to be safe from the Midianites. Well, enter our boy Gideon. Gideon's just a regular dude growing up. And he's afraid, just like the rest of his people. And the story begins with him kind of hiding from the Midianites. 
he's down in this wine press threshing wheat. Now, you might ask, what's threshing wheat? I've got a little video for you if you didn't grow up on the farm. This is threshing wheat. So it's a process by which you, you throw the stuff up in the air, and the, the dust, the, the cruddy parts blow away, and the good part of the wheat, that's down at the bottom, and that's the stuff that you use to cook with, threshing wheat. So this is how they did it back then. There's all this dust in the air. It's a, it's, a, it's a miserable, difficult process. And you've got Gideon doing it in a wine press. Now, this is what a wine press looks like. So back then, people would crawl down in there and stomp on the grapes, and the, and the juice would go down through the hole and then through the trough system, and, and that's how they collected wine. So it's, it's down deep in a hole. The last place you'd ever want to thresh wheat. Because, again, you saw the dust. Imagine that whole thing would be one big dust cloud in there. You'd be breathing it and sneezing and itching. It would have been a miserable experience. But he's so afraid, this is where he's doing it. I mean, you've got to have wheat. You've got to eat. But you're afraid to do it out in public, so you do it down in a hole. This is where God finds Gideon. An angel appears and gives Gideon a vision. Last week, we talked about when God does addition in people's lives, he always makes it count, makes our lives count by starting with vision. He adds vision first. But vision is also huge in God's subtraction. Vision is necessary from God in our lives so that we know what we're supposed to subtract. It always goes on God's vision. So let's see how this works out now with Gideon. His, his story begins there in the wine press. The angel of the Lord appears and says to him, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Now, we kind of got to stop there because that's crazy talk. This is some Bible humor right now. This is hilarious because mighty hero. You got Gideon, a normal dude, so afraid he's crawled down in a wine press to get his wheat. He's no hero. He should have been up there fighting the Midianites. But instead, he's kind of a scaredy cat. But God shows up and calls him a hero. It's kind of crazy. But you see, this is the good thing with God. This is the good thing with God. God sees the potential in your life and mine. He saw the potential in Gideon. It didn't matter to God that Gideon was a scaredy cat down the bottom of a wine press threshing wheat. It didn't matter at all. Because God knew what Gideon could become. That's what God sees in us. And that's what makes the story so amazing for us all these years later. Because we see how God interacts with us even when we're scared. This is an example for each of us. When we're down in our own little wine presses of our lives, kind of struggling along and afraid and worried about things, God shows up and he looks at you and says, you're a mighty hero. That's what I see in you. I mean, it's God saying it. It's amazing stuff. God sees how much we can count, how much we can do in our lives in the midst of us feeling weak. That's what they were singing about, right? You can feel weak, but God sees that you're strong. God sees you're, an, you're a hero. What you can do in your life, what you can do in your career, what you can do in your church, God sees all of it. God doesn't see what we're not. God sees what we can become. And it's all about vision. So here's the vision part now for Gideon. If we continue in the scripture, it says, Rescue Israel from the Midianites. What? It's Gideon, the scared dude in the wine press. And God says, You are going to rescue your people. That's the vision. God tells Gideon he has a plan for him to count. But imagine now, you're Gideon, right? Gideon responds like we would respond, like we probably do respond a lot of times. With what? Maybe fear, lack of confidence. That, that, that God, you might be calling me to this, but I, it can't be me. I'm just a regular dude. I, I can't do it. I have all these mistakes in my life and all these areas I'm not perfect. I can't do that for you, God. That's Gideon. Gideon starts by questioning God. Gideon is so far from God at that moment. God shows up and says, hey, I got this plan for you. You're going to be a hero. You're going to lead your people. And Gideon says to God, hold up, God. Where have you been? Can you imagine saying that to God? Where have you been? I remember in the past, like our ancestors, you were always helping them and stuff. And now it doesn't seem like you care at all. What are you doing lately, God? Have you ever maybe felt that way with God? Like life isn't going so hot. And you're like, hey, God, what's up? Why aren't you helping me more? That's where Gideon starts. He's no different than us. And then he goes on with his next roadblock. He says to God, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe. Essentially, he's saying, my circumstances aren't good enough. My team isn't strong enough. I don't have enough resources. 
I can't do it, God. First of all, I don't know if I should trust you. Second of all, I don't even have what I need. That's what Gideon says to God. But God will subtract that roadblock for Gideon. There's a roadblock hindering God's vision for Gideon. Blame. He's blaming God. He's blaming not enough other people. God's going to subtract that for him. And then look at this. Here's the the next excuse. Gideon says, he tells God, I'm the least in my entire family. So essentially he's saying, my family stinks. We're weak. I'm the weakest one in the family. I can't do this. I can't do it, is what he says. Thanks, Mike. That page is no good anyways. (laughs) I didn't didn't need that one. (laughs) So... Gideon's like, I'm the weakest one here. My family stinks. Everything stinks. You stink, God. I can't do this, is what Gideon says. Gideon is fearful. But God's going to help Gideon subtract that fear from his life, too. He's going to remove the roadblock. God always works through leaders. That's what he does. God's going to use Gideon as a leader. doesn't matter if you're the weakest weakest link in a weak family. God turns people into leaders. That's how he's worked all through history, and that's how he still works today. God doesn't change. It's the awesome thing about God. He doesn't change. You can trust him. Basically, he's saying, Gideon, I know you feel weak. I know you feel unprepared. You're ill-equipped. You've got dirt all over you and dust from the wheat. I know. You're a mess. But God says, I will make you strong. I will do it. Here it is. Look at this. Here, Here it is. God says, I'm sending you. I'm sending you. God works through regular people and makes us leaders. He makes us count. And I said it last week, after vision, God adds leaders. But great leaders need to be great subtractors. And Gideon's going to learn this well. First, God helped him subtract the blame. He helped him subtract his fear. But Gideon doesn't realize that God's about to do some crazy subtraction in his life to show him how powerful God is. God's going to do some crazy subtraction because when God moves with God's vision, some stuff's just got to be subtracted. Some stuff's got to get out of the way to show who God is. So what happens with Gideon is this. Finally, he goes, okay, God, I'm in. I'm in. Now we're going to go fight the Midianites. And there's like 120,000 Midianites and there's like 30,000 of us. We're in. Now at that point, maybe 30,000 could beat 120,000. Maybe through some great strategy or or whatever. Maybe you could pull it off. So God says, it's not about you. You don't don't gotta pull it off. So I tell you what. Ask the thirty thousand if anybody's scared. And if they're scared, then go on home. Twenty thousand left. So thirty thousand became ten thousand. They're looking around going, Okay, I guess we can do it. Ten to one odds? Yeah, we can we can do it. We can do it. We can do it. And you know, maybe ten to one works once in a while, right? I don't know. We could do it. God says, you know what? Nah. You, you don't, you don't. It, this is on me. It's not about you, Gideon. You don't, you don't need 10,000. It's not about all those dudes. It's about me. So I tell you what, he, he takes them through another little process, and they come down to 300 guys. 300. And then God says, okay, that's a good number. 300 versus 100,000. Go to it. And they do, and they win. See, God works through subtraction. And in subtraction, we can see leaders. We can see God's vision. We can see God's power. It's not on us. It's on God. You know, last week I talked a lot about RCC's vision. And and I reminded you that our church has a really simple vision to help you take the next step in your relationship with God. That's the vision of this church. So if you've been coming here for a long time, hopefully you know that. Um, If you're brand new, that's new for you. Yay, there you go. That's the vision. But it's the vision for a reason. Because at RCC, we say everybody fits. And with this vision, you fit. No matter where you're at in your faith walk right now. Maybe right now you're at a place where like, you know, like Gideon was there, like, God, I don't even trust you. Where have you been, God? Maybe you're there right now. Gideon was there and it worked out okay. It can work out okay for you. You just got to take some steps. And this is a perfect place to kind of figure out what you believe and take your steps at your pace. No one's going to judge you or pressure you. It's a chance for you to take your own steps. Or... Maybe you've been in this church or other good churches for a long time, and you really believe in God. You trust God completely. You've been following Jesus the best you can for many years. 
we still have steps to take. We're still all growing in our faith and our understanding of God and how God works in our lives. That's why it's the vision for the church, because it fits all of us. It's what this church exists to do. I would like every single person here this morning to be able to take steps closer to God. So when it comes to living out God's vision for a church or as an individual, you can't just tell me what you're doing. You you also have to tell me what you're not doing anymore, what's changing. You can't just say what you're adding to your life. You have to say what you're subtracting as well that maybe didn't work out so well last week or last year or you realize isn't for you. And there's a whole lot of things that, that we've subtracted here at church to kind of stay the course, to continue to follow God's vision as a church family. There's all sorts of roadblocks that we've had to subtract. One of them is huge. I mentioned it last week. It was the biggest question of the summer. We've kind of subtracted our other church building. We have this really nice building downtown, and we met there for 17 years almost, and it, it's amazing. But finally we said, listen, we, we just don't all fit anymore. And this is really hard. It's a great place to worship. I, lots of people love it. It's got this intimacy thing going on. It's, it's amazing. So we said, we're going to have to subtract it to continue to follow God's vision. We're going to have to give up something really good to do the next thing. And I, I talked a lot about it last week. I won't go into it. But the one thing I'll say is this. People have come to me over the summer and said, it doesn't feel the same at the high school. I, I miss the old building. I totally understand. I totally, totally understand. My suggestion to you is I've done some measuring You should sit closer. I said this last week. I'll say it again if you weren't here last week. Right now, as I stand here, and and Mike waves to all the nice people from the front row, where Mike is right there, that would be the middle of the room at RCC, from me to him. It would be like he's in the middle of the room. And now he's right there in the front row. That's how much bigger this room is to that room. So if you sit in the front row here, it's like you sat in the middle of the room at the old place. So if you like the middle of the room, you need to sit in the front row here to get the same experience. If you sit like five rows or further back at our other building, you'd be sitting in Ransom Street. That Literally, that's how far away you are. So if you're having trouble like engaging and, 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 and working with the songs and, and singing with the bands, and it just doesn't feel the same, or you're farther from me or whatever, just sit closer. It's okay. Move on down. Last week, or last week I said someone could sit in the front row. First service, someone showed up with a lawn chair and sat right there. <laughs> literally. It was awesome. And I didn't even see him at first. Like, I was just talking and talking. And then I looked down. I was like, there's a dude, like, right there. <laughs> bring your lawn chairs. I don't, I don't, maybe it's fire code. I'm not sure. Maybe you can't. But until they tell us we can't, bring lawn chairs, I recliners. I don't care what you do. It's RCC. Be yourself. Make yourself comfortable. It's fine. But we had to subtract the building because of God's vision. Last week, I talked about we're subtracting Aaron. Pastor Aaron. I love Pastor Aaron. I've known Aaron since he's a kid. He's been on staff seven years. He does an amazing job. He feels like family to me. Plus, he's a great employee. I I hate to see him go. But we're subtracting him for God's vision. He's going to Fond du Lac to start a church in Fond du Lac. And that's God's vision for our church. Just a little tough. Subtraction can be tough. But God makes it okay. If it's his vision, he makes it okay. We've grown as much as a church through subtraction as we have addition. And it's how it works personally in our lives as well. When you begin thinking about God's vision for your life, you can't just tell me what you're adding. You also have to tell me what you're subtracting. And that kind of subtraction for God, that takes commitment. That's the next thing. It takes commitment. Here it is from Scripture. The Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have. Go with the strength you have. So here comes the commitment part from Gideon. He's got to go. He don't have much. Ill-equipped, scared. But at some point, he had to say, I'm in, God. I'm in. I'll go. You told me to go. I'm going to go. God always uses ill-equipped people as leaders. But you have to be committed to him and his vision for you for him to use you. You have to be willing to go with whatever you have. Lots of times here, people ask me how I feel before I speak. Or you might see me in, in the hall before the service. Like, How's it going? And if it's before the, before the second service or before the first service, I'm always, I, I don't know. Okay, they ask me at noon. I never know until noon how it's going. They ask me what's going through my mind, and you know what it is? I feel like Gideon, ill-equipped. It's just the way it is. This, you, you might think this is kind of who I am up here, but it really isn't. I'm just a regular dude. I'm just ill-equipped for this. That's the truth of it. 
It's always been that way for 17 years. But a long time ago, even before that, I learned something very valuable that I'd love for you to embrace for your own selves. God's not concerned about my ability. He's concerned about my availability. You just got to show up. If God wants you to do something, he's blessing you and leading you to do something, giving you the vision for something, you just got to show up. And then God does it through you. You aren't qualified. Welcome to the real world. But if you're open, God can use you. Just like me, just like Gideon. The same in your life too. I don't care who you are. I don't care how many roadblocks or excuses you put up. I don't care if you feel ill-equipped. If you're committed to God and his vision in your life, you're right where God uses people. You're right in the middle of his big math equation. You're perfectly suited. Sometimes people tell me, oh, I'm too young. You're never too young. God's worked through young people for thousands of years. You're not too young to be used by God. God can do amazing things through young people. You're never too young for God. You're never too young to do amazing things at RCC. Never. God uses young people all the time. You're never too old. Last week, this is, here's a story from last week after the second service. Um, it, it, the story kind of makes me feel good and makes me feel bad at the same time. After the service, I was out in the commons, and, and a couple that's older than me came to me and said, you know, thank you that, that we fit here. Thank, thank you that despite, you know, we thought maybe we were too old for this place, because there aren't young people here, but thank you that being on the bit older side for this church family, um, we still feel like we fit. We still feel valuable. And I was so happy in the moment, right? I was like, I'm so happy they feel valuable, because they are. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. Everyone's the same value here. So I was happy that they understood that. Like some of my goofiness didn't throw them off. They still felt valuable to God and valuable to this church. They're so valuable to God. But then I felt a little sad the rest of the day because I'm like, are there people out there that don't feel valuable? Like maybe they feel like they're too old and they don't fit. You're never too old for RCC. So you're never too young. You're never too old. You just have to be willing to offer to God what you got. Whatever it is. I'm in, God. Young or old, doesn't matter. Messed up, ill-equipped, doesn't matter. Gideon-like, so what? It doesn't matter. You just got to stand up and say, I'm in. I'll, I'll give you what I got. That's all it takes. There, there is no too young or too old for God. Too old. God's really old. So, oh, oh, I'm 80, God. That's old. God's like 80? That's nothing. I'm eternal. 80? That's like a speck. Never too old. Never too young. Just commit. But you have to start subtracting. If you're going to commit, whether you're young or old, there's things that got to go. What are you not going to do anymore? If you're adding all the time, you're just going to get in trouble. You're going to be burnt out. Subtraction always tests this. It, it, it tests your commitment quotient. Subtraction tests this. But when we're willing to do some serious subtraction in our lives to follow God's vision, he always helps us. This is what he says to Gideon. God says to him, I will be with you. Do you see that? As soon as Gideon commits, God's like, I'll be with you. I'm in. You're in. I'm in. That's what God says to all of us. You're in. I'm in. Draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. That's what Scripture says. You're in. I'm in, says God. God offers to help. God always blesses what he approves. It's a really simple thing to embrace in your life. Whatever aspect of your life it is, finances, relationship, jobs, decisions, school decisions, whatever, God blesses what he approves. If you're doing stuff God approves of, he helps you. If you're doing stuff he doesn't approve of, a good parent would never help you do that. God blesses what he approves. So when you say you're in, he blesses you. And because of God's blessings on RCC, to make this personal for me, I get a, a, a lot of invitations because of, because of this church and, and how well it's gone. But I say no to 95% of the invitations I get. And I'm not talking about like invitations to a fun party or like the Packers game or something. I'm talking about like conferences or opportunities to speak someplace or meetings or that kind of stuff. They're, they're great people. They're, it's an amazing organization, whatever. It's a giant conference, whatever it is. And I say no 95% of the time, easily. I say no to lots of good things. I have to subtract lots of good things in my life because of God's vision for my life. I say no to good things so I can say yes to greater things, areas where he's already blessed me. I say no to good things because of my relationship with my wife. I want to have a certain relationship with her, and that means a lot of other things have to be no's. I've had to say no to a lot of things because of my relationship with my kids. I've had to say no to a lot of things because of my role here at RCC. 
th- this is my primary focus. This is the vision that God gave me. So while there's other awesome things out there, you have to say no. It's the same for all of us. We all have to say no to lots of stuff. You may not believe this. I subtract 50% of my sermon every week. Are you afraid to laugh at that? <laughs> Who's clapping out there? <laughs> You're lucky. These bright lights, it's hard to see. I don't have any clue who that was. It's true. You're like, oh, man, this would be horrible if it was twice as long. But it's true. Like, I write more than twice as much as I actually use on a Sunday morning. And throughout the week, it's like, yeah, this, isn't, this has got to go. This has got to go. Just off to the side it goes. It gets crossed out with a red pen. I subtract more than 50% every week. So th- just imagine, this is the good half of what was left, right? <laughs> if this isn't so hot, the other half was worse, just so you know. But I thought it was good. Spent a lot of time writing it and studying it and finding the Bible verses and all that stuff. It's like, eh, it's still got to go. Good stuff has to be subtracted from our lives. What roadblock from your life do you need to subtract? So that you can live God's vision for your life. What do you got to subtract from your activities? What do you got to subtract from your career? What or who do you need to subtract so that you can live God's vision for your life? It could be a person. Someone's really holding you back. There's this friendship that, like, it's a great person, but, man, they're really keeping you from being the best that God has to offer for you. Serious subtraction is tough stuff. I know we're ill-equipped. It's the way it is. We're human. God's used to us, though, and he still wants us. You and I are the last part of his equation every time. When God does miracles... When God does miracles, he works through people just like us, just like Gideon. He starts with vision, he adds leadership within you, commitment, and then you. And through all that, we get to see miracles. You get to see miracles. Just like Gideon did, just like I get to see miracles all the time here at church, you get to see miracles. And I, and I know, you, you're sitting there right now saying maybe you're ill-equipped. Yeah, I'm ill-equipped for miracles. That's not me. You're not seeing yourself like God sees you, though. Because God sees you as a masterpiece. I shared this verse last week. I'm going to share it again. It's Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. I shared that verse last week. It's, it's one of my favorite verses in Scripture. And I was excited about it. And then I got home. And usually on Sunday afternoons, Janet and I kind of talk about church and talk about how it went and, you know, whatever. And as we were talking about it, she said she made that verse personal for herself. She just wrote it out for herself and was going to read it in the mornings. And For I am God's masterpiece, created to do the things he's planned for me, is essentially what she told me. I'm like, oh, that's brilliant. Wish I would have had that for the sermon. Luckily, I was speaking again this week. So we put it on Facebook this week. Maybe you, you go to the church Facebook thing. Um, but I have it for you as well. Th- th- this, is, this is what we have written out, okay? Here's the scripture. And here's us applying that to our individual lives, your lives. You could say to this, I am God's masterpiece. He has created me so I can do the good things he planned for me today. I want you to be able to say that. So I'm going to suggest you do what Janet suggested to me. And instead of like having to write it out yourself, on your way out today, we have these little cards for you. I'd love for you to take one. It's, It's that. That's what's written on the card. I'd love for you to take one, and then you could put it on your fridge or your mirror in your car, you know, like whatever you want, and you could say this in the morning. You, you could say it between you and God. You're agreeing with God. That's a prayer. You're agreeing with what he says in Scripture. That's a way for you to worship God. I agree with you, God. I'm your masterpiece. I was created to do something today. I want to do it. I'm going to try. This will help. So I, I want you to take one, and I want you to practice saying it. Because you're making Scripture personal in your life, and you're applying it as God would want you to apply it. But what roadblock do you need to subtract this week? What's got to go? What's something in your life that's got to go to make your life count more, to make your church count more? What's got to go? So that you're available to God to say, I'm here. I'm here. I'm weak, but I'm here. That's all he needs you to say. Because God is still counting, and he wants to count you in. With that, I'm going to pray, and, and after I pray, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the big announcement that I've been talking about. I'm going to do that, but before the announcement, I'm going to pray, and what I'm going to pray for is this, that God would help us be so committed to him that we're willing to look for his vision and subtract whatever needs to be subtracted. What needs to be subtracted from your life could very well be very, very different than mine. doesn't matter. But that God would work through each of us and help us know what to subtract so that we could make our lives count more, make our church count more.
I'm going to ask God to bless us for trying. So if you want God's blessing in your life this week, if you want to do that, bow your heads, and I'll ask God for all of us. Dear Lord, first of all, thank you for working through regular people. It, that you see us as heroes, God, or masterpieces is, is mind-blowing. So thank you for working through Gideon. Thank you for saving his story for us so that we could see how you work through us. And God, right now, we, we commit ourselves. We're, we're saying we're committed to you. We want your vision in our lives. And we're asking you, God, what, what do we need to subtract so that we can make our lives count and we can make our church count? Help us know what to subtract, God, and then give us the faith, Lord, and the strength to actually subtract it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I told you that every week this month I was going to make a big announcement and I was going to answer a big question. So the big announcement today is this. For the last 17 years, the most asked for ministry at RCC has been a marriage ministry. People have challenged me, said, let's do more for marriages. And it was a really, really good challenge, but I had a couple hang-ups with it. Number one, over all these years, I've seen lots of great marriage things out there, like weekend getaways where it's like a marriage conference, and, and they're very, very good. So for us to try to do better than already exists, you know, could be difficult. They're, they're very, very good. And then lots of churches do sermon series is about marriage. Like they might have four weeks or six or eight weeks on a marriage series. And, and I've never wanted to do that. And I have no judgment for any other church. That's not my business at all. I'm happy they do it, and I'm sure they're trying to do exactly what God's telling them to do. But, but for me, I always felt like uh, I didn't want to do it because half the people in the room aren't married. So to talk about married stuff for eight weeks, I was like, I, I feel bad for the half the people that aren't married. So I've never had a whole marriage series here. And, and again, other places do, and, and they're great churches. But what should we do? So all these years, we've been trying to figure out what should we do. And for the last like year plus, we've been really working on it. So I'm announcing today that we're going to offer an RCC Marriage Academy. And here's the deal with the Marriage Academy. Number one, uh, we're not going to hold anything back. I've been working on this for many, many years. I've been married for a long time. I've done a lot of marriage counseling. I, I know what the real stuff is in marriages. I know what the gritty stuff is. I know what the difficult stuff is. I know what people struggle with. I've helped people struggle through it. So we're going to talk about intimacy. We're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about the stuff you fight about at home. We're going to talk about how difficult parenting can be. And it's going to be gritty and, and down to earth. But it's going to be real. And the goal for the whole thing, if you're, if you're brave enough to come, the goal for the whole thing is we want to help you get on the same page with your spouse. Not my page. Your marriage doesn't need to look like mine. Not, not a church page. But, but how can we all get on, uh, or how can each couple get on their own page so that they're connected better than they ever have been before. That's the goal. Now, here's what's required of you. It's going to be the second Tuesday night of each month, starting in October, and it goes through June. So one Tuesday night a month, October through June, and then there's a, an optional um, marriage getaway, like a Friday, Saturday, Friday night, Saturday getaway, as well in February. But we're limiting it to 40 couples. And we already had like 15 sign up at the, fir at the first service. So you're going to have to move quick, I think, if you want to be involved. Um, you could sign up right now or today. Um, if you go to, like, like, the offering stuff and the church bulletin and all the announcements, if you go to the Wi-Fi and then you go to RCC Sunday, there's a link right there where you can click on it and you can sign up with you and your spouse. But you have to commit to being there at all of them. Okay, you can't just kind of come and go or whatever. This is going to be intense. It's going to build each month. So you've got to commit to all of them. Not that you couldn't, like, oh, get called into work or, you know, you're sick one time or something. I, I understand that happens. But your intention would be, I want to make all of these. I want to make all of them. If you can't do that right now, it's like, you know, maybe your spouse isn't here or, you know, whatever. You want to think about it, talk about it, pray about it, all that kind of stuff. You could still sign up during the week. Um, to do that, you just email Sam Prelick, Pastor Sam, Sam Prelick at ribbonchurch.com. You can email Sam and say, hey, Sam, we'd like to get into the Marriage Academy. But I'm telling you, it's going to be real. And, and I, I bet there's going to be a whole bunch of conversations in the car on the way home or once you get home and the kids go in the other room the, um, between husbands and wives, and the dude will be like, I don't want to do it. Right? That's, that's, that's uh, wait, I don't want to do it. I, I, more like, <laughs> Packers are on. I'm not talking about that right now. Um, you, you're probably going to hear it, right? Dudes, I'm a dude. I get it. I'm not going to try to turn you into a girl at the marriage academy, all right? And I know, I've been talking too long today, I started saying stupid stuff, but you, you can be all man and all married and all for God all at the same time. You don't, you don't have to change into something you're not. You can be an, a, an amazing man, but a man that is amazing to his wife and to his God as well. So don't be afraid. I, I, if you think you're more dude than me, you'll be surprised. I get it. 
and I want you to come. I want you to be brave enough to come because we're going to get real. It's going to be serious. It's going to be deep. It's going to be harsh. But I'd be shocked if you tell me after whatever, eight months it is or whatever, your marriage hasn't improved. I'd be shocked. So I invite you to come, especially the guys. Guys, go home and ask your wife. Say, we should go to this. I, I'd be shocked if it doesn't help you. So that's the big announcement. Biggest ministry initiative so far that's been asked for marriage, and we're finally going to do it, and we're going to do it RCC style, and we're going to do it big, and it's going to be great. So that's the announcement. I have one more thing. I have to answer a question. I told you in the email this week I was going to answer a question about RCC finances. The biggest question of the summer was, um, what are we doing with the high school and the church building and stuff? And I answered that last week. You can listen online if you missed it. Um, and I talked a little bit about today. Next week, we're going to talk about all the big staff changes that are coming in the coming months. I'll talk about that next week. This week, I'm going to talk about the finances, because here's what's happened. We're, we're, we're totally transparent here, so we have in the bulletin every week the financial, financial information. And people have seen, like, wow, the offering is like $2,000 a week for a little budget. What's going on? Are we okay? Are we safe as a church? Are we going bankrupt? Really good question. So first thing, you got to know this if you're new here. It's okay to ask me anything. I like questions, and the tougher the better. I think that's fun. It shows me you're interested. It shows me that you care. So you can't, like, turn me off with a bad question. I love them. So for all of you who have been asking the financial stuff, keep asking. That's amazing. I love it. And you've looked at that and said, what's the deal? Especially if you've been here for a long time, because, like, we're never below budget and giving. 17 years, we're always above budget and giving. This year's the first time ever we've been below. Here's why. Um, as we started out this year, we made the move to the high school, and we eliminated services on Saturday night at the old building. We had people coming from all sorts of other towns um, to those Saturday night services that really weren't part of the RCC family, it, it, but they loved the Saturday night service option. So they came from long distances because we offered a great Saturday night service. Well, we don't offer that now, and so those people are staying in their towns and not coming, and, and some of those people gave quite a lot. Um, so we've had to subtract <laughs> their offerings, and then we've also had some couples that were families that are very, very committed financially move away to other cities and stuff. So giving is way down this year. It's just the way it is. However, I'm super conservative, so I saw that trend happening already back in winter. I'm like, ooh, what's going on here? And started making adjustments. So first of all, we reduced all of the budget lines, like 10% across the board, to help cover for that. And then Pastor Jack retired in February, March, during that time frame. So we lost a whole full-time employee. A full-time employee makes a lot of money. So by losing an employee and reducing the budget category, we're still doing just fine. We're absolutely okay financially. There's a, you know, a little bit of stress on the staff that we've had to pitch in a little bit more to cover for one missing person. But you have a super dedicated staff, and they're fine right now. So you have nothing to worry about. The church is healthy financially. We have no debt or anything like that. We're perfectly fine. Don't worry. Here's kind of how kind of money situation or offering situation works at all churches, okay? I'll just explain it really, really quick. Oftentimes you come to a church and you're kind of new, and it's like, I don't necessarily want to give here yet. You don't trust yet. Totally understand. I see it as God's money anyways. God gave you that money. You have to be a good steward of it. So giving it someplace you don't trust would be foolish. You should trust first. So people come for quite a while and say, I don't know yet. There's lots of bad stories about churches and dirty pastors and stuff. I don't know if I can give there. I commend that. You should be thinking. That's awesome. Eventually, people say, hmm, okay, I trust. I kind of like this place. And you look around and say, hmm, I was here. My family was here, whatever. That's worth a certain amount. Like, I want to be responsible for myself. I want to pay my own way, so to speak. And people start to give. Time goes on. You look around some more and go, huh. There's lots of people here that are new that I know aren't giving. I want to make this possible for them. I don't have a little kid in children's ministry, but I want to be sure children's ministry exists, so I want to give more than I have been giving. And people's giving generally increases over time. And then eventually someone goes, hmm, I really value the vision. God is moving here. I see God moving here. It's not just about me. It's about a much greater vision. I want to give to that vision. So I'm going to give even if I'm not there. Like they, they go online and just click a thing, and they give every week whether they're here or not. Because church happens every week, whether you're here or not. That's kind of the next step. And then there's a final step a lot of times people get to and say, listen, I'm going to do what God says. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give 10%. Those are kind of the steps in giving. You are all somewhere on that process. That's between you and God. I never want to be a place that arm twists anyone or guilt someone into giving. You should be excited to give to God. So if you're excited to give to God here and growing in excitement, awesome. Give and give happily. If you're not there yet, that's okay, too. That's why we always say when the basket comes by, just pass it by if you're not there yet. That's absolutely fine, too, at RCC. 
But as a church, we're healthy financially. We've always been healthy financially. So with that said, I think I talked enough about money for the morning. Um, there's going to be an offering. Hey, what timing. Um, but normally now we'd have an offering video, and since I've already talked about the offering, we won't do an offering video. So the hosts are going to come down. I, I think they're in the room. I don't know. Or maybe they're not in the room. The hosts are going to the hosts are going to come down, and um, the band's. Wow, this is what happens when you talk too long. It's like the band just comes out. <laughs> now it's just me. Next, they're going to turn off my microphone in a second. The hosts will come down and receive your offering, or you can give online by going to the, the church Wi or school Wi Fi. Go to the church website and give that way as well. Both ways are absolutely fine. I'm super happy that you're here this morning. I'm super happy that I'm done talking, and I know they have what four more fun songs. <laughs> no, you're not going to do extra like I did. Two, two, two more songs.